Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. Glad you're here today. Today we're going to talk about, is it well with your soul? And we just got through singing the great rendition of, it is well with my soul. What a great and wonderful song that is. It is well with my soul is a favorite song among churches today. I mean, I can talk to a lot of different people. They go to a lot of different churches. And if you ask them, they know this song, they probably tell you yes. And then a lot of people tell me it's one of their favorites. Do we really know what we're singing about when it comes to this song, though? Do we really know what we're singing about? Have you took the time out to look at the words of this song? To sing this song correctly, we must have a strong conviction in our hearts to God. And that's just the way I feel about it. Because if you don't have that strong conviction to God and you're singing this song, to me, you're missing it. You're missing the point. It takes a strong conviction to me to really sing this song. And I tell you what, the way we sung it this morning, I felt that conviction within this congregation. And I'm proud to say that. This song was written in 1873 by H.G. Spafford after a great tragedy in his life. His wife and four daughters were on a ship headed to Europe from America. The ship they were on collided with another ship and the wife was the only survivor. The daughters drowned. H.G. took the next ship to go to be with his wife. When the ship got to where the other two ships collided, the captain called H.G. to the bridge to let him know where the wreckage had taken place. It was there at that moment he began to write this great song. Wow, that's just powerful when you think about that. The captain let him know, hey, we're at the place where, where, where the ships went down. And I imagine as he went back to his cabin, he started writing this song. It's amazing when you think about that. Because he wrote this song at a great tragedy in his life. Instead, he wrote a song that describes his devotion to God, even though he went through that great tragedy. He did not blame God or become discouraged with God. He did not give up on God. To say it is well with my soul means, to, means that he stayed faithful to God. Because tragedies, tragedies can change a person's life. I mean, it can. I know of a lady that was married to a good Christian man. They had a good Christian family. They taught many children. They had one of the best, best vacation Bible schools ever that I've ever been to. But when her husband died, she stopped going to church. She lost her way. It happens. It happens. There are a lot of different events that happens in our lives that, that sometimes makes our faith waver, that sometimes make us think, God doesn't know what he's doing, is he? But H.G., who lost four daughters, to him his devotion became even greater. Let's examine the course of this song and the three verses of this song to see what we can learn to help us keep our faith in God. The course is, it is well with my soul. And I just love the way we sing that and the way it's set up that, you know, you have this high part and then you have the bass part on it and it's just so, it is well, it is well. I mean, it's just, you just love that. But man, when you're singing that, it is well what you're saying. No matter what happens to me, God, I'm with you. No matter what. It's simply saying that even though you may go through hard times, you keep yourself focused on God. Knowing he, God, knows what's best for you at that time. And that's basically what that means. Paul sums it up in 2 Timothy 1 and 12. Paul says this, this is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause 
for shame because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul says, I know who I believed in and I'm convinced that he can take care of me and I can ask him anything and he will take care of it. I, be, I can entrust anything with God and he will take care of it. Paul was very convinced. Paul also wrote in Philippians 4 and 7, he says, the peace of God which transcends all understandings. Because see, we don't know everything that's going on. We don't understand why we were in that bad car wreck and, and we may have to go to the hospital and get attended. We don't understand why maybe we have to go through some of those things, those hard times of life. You, don't, you might not understand. When I got married, I, I married a beautiful woman, an awesome woman, and she still is awesome, even though we're not together. I still love her. She's a great person, a great woman. But man, when she told me she was leaving me and there was nothing I could do about it, the first thing I thought about was, God, don't worry about me. I'm still with you. Because I understood that Satan was coming after me through her, and I could not let him take me down because my wife left me. But divorce is a hard thing to go through. It really is. There's a lot of baggage that comes with that. And it's not good. And if you got kids, it's even worse because the kids have to go through it. I'm counseling a guy right now that wants, wants us to help his son. And, and, and you know, we do the best we can. But he went through, a, he made a mistake in his marriage and it busted his family up. But at least now he came back to God and he got forgiveness. And, and he even talked to the wife and, and they're no longer together, but they forgave each other and they moved on. But we have to realize that the peace of God will transcend all these understand. We just need to stay in God. The peace of God will transcend all understandings and it will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. See, if you don't guard your heart and your mind, your mind will run with things. Well, God's being mad at me. God's being mean to me. He caused this to make me hate him. I mean, I've heard people say that. People blame God all the time. And yet it's not God. It's not God. In verse 9, it says, the God of peace will be with you. That peace that God has, when it's with you, it will help you get through some tough things. And so we need to learn to encompass that peace. We need to learn to love that peace. In uh, 1 Peter verses 1, 4, and 5, Peter was writing there, and he was giving the Christians at that time some living hope. And this is one of the things he said in that scripture. You have an inheritance that can never perish. It is kept in heaven. That's that hope. Heaven. That's where we want to be. With God. For you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. When that salvation comes, we are guaranteed to go to heaven. As long as we continue to repent. As long as we continue to stay faithful to God. And not let nothing come in between us and God. And that's the chorus. That's the chorus. It is well with my soul because I know that my God lives. It is well with my soul because I know God loves me and he's going to take care of me. You ever think about Job? He lost his kids. He lost his stock. He lost a lot of stuff. But he stayed faithful to God and God did what? Blessed him with it all over again even more. That's the kind of God we serve. All because Job understood who God was. And he stuck with God even though he went through those tragedies. Verse 1. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say. It is well. It is well with my soul. You know, when peace like a river attendeth my way, that's a pleasant thing, actually. There's actually a scripture for that in uh, Isaiah 66, 12, if you guys want to read that and look that up. And I actually meant to put it down here, but I kind of forgot. But anyway, when peace like a river attendeth my way, it's a good thing. 
But when sorrows like sea billows roll, it's a bad thing. See, we have good and bad times in our lives. Whatever comes our way, we are taught to believe in God. If you read the word of God and if you're a Christian, you're taught that no matter what happens, whatever your lot, can you say it is well with my soul? Or do you start playing the blame game? That's what happened when Adam and Eve, when God confronted Adam, what is this you've done? It was the woman. The woman, what is this you've done? It was the serpent. We want to blame. Instead of just saying, God, I messed up. Please forgive me. Take me back. We need to confront it. We need to just understand that we're going to go through good times and bad times. But whatever, whatever we're in, wherever we're at, Paul said, I'm, con I'm, I'm um, what's the word? I'm content in all situations because I know whom I serve. And that's the way we need to be. Um, what are your attitudes when faced with hard times? What is your behavior? What is your demeanor? Do you fly off the handle and blame everybody? Do you lose your temper? Do you, do you step out of yourself and then you go, oh Lord, please forgive me, I messed up. Or as a Christian, are you learning to stay humble and keep your cool? And when bad things happen, just go to your knees right away. Because that's what we should do. But there's all kind of different things we go through when we go through those hard times and those trials. James 1, 2, and 4 says, Consider it pure joy when you face many kinds of trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. James says, when you go through these hard times, count them joy. Yay, I'm going through a hard time. Boy, you know how hard that is to do. But I'm proud to say that when I go through hard times, and I realize I'm going through a hard time. Okay, okay, God. What are we going through here? Help me to understand it. Help me to know where I need to be and, and, and just guide me through this. Because a lot of times I don't know. Sometimes I do know what to do right away, but sometimes I don't know what to do right away. You know, and sometimes I'm so caught up in to whatever it is I'm in that I, that I don't even think about God, I'm sorry to say at times. And then after I go, oh man, I should have been thinking about what God wanted me to do in that situation. Instead of getting carried away and caught up in the uh, the worlds of the way uh, uh, the way of the world, James says, "Count it pure joy, because when your faith is tested, it produces perseverance. That when perseverance finishes its work, so you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything." I remember when I was eight years old, Keith and Tony King moved into our neighborhood. And the, the second day they were living there, it was a Saturday. And they were out early in the morning throwing the football around. It was that morning that Charles Belafonte got introduced to football. I went outside and Keith King, who could throw the ball, Keith was six, I was eight. But I'm telling you, he could throw the ball about 40 yards when he was six years old. He threw the ball, said, catch. And I just ran to catch it. And I ran and it went right through my, I had never thrown a football before. That was the first day that I had ever played football. And through Keith and Tony, I learned the game and I loved the game. And we had our own little team. I lived on South 8th Street in Nashville, Tennessee. We had our team, we were the South 8th Raiders. Cause, Cause Tony liked the Oakland Raiders. So we were the South 8th Raiders. And we would play games against South 7th and South 6th and South 9th and, and, and we'd play games with these kids. And, and my second year, when I was nine years old, we played. We didn't lose a game, we beat all those guys. And when I see those guys in school, I'd pray, oh, we beat you, God, we, you know, because I got to be pretty good. They taught me the game really well and I learned. And then the next year, Tony King's dad said, I'm gonna put you guys all on a team. You guys need to be on a, a real team with shoulder pads and helmets. And I remember walking out and getting dressed in my helmets. And I had been watching, you know, Dallas Cowboys. I used to love them back in the day when they had Roger Stallback and Tony Hill. Uh, not Tony Hill, but uh, Grant Hill's dad, whatever. his <laughs> Calvin Hill, that's his name. But anyway, um, uh, I wanted to be like those guys, Bob Hayes. You know, I wanted to be like those guys. 
And I remember putting on my pants the first time. And my mom goes, boy, you, really, you know how to put all that stuff on, Charles? How do you know that? Well, people taught me. And I remember we went to our first practice. And Coach Roper was a big man. He's, he's probably the biggest. He's about like 6'4". He was a big man. And he demanded perfection. And he was teaching us how to tackle. And Keith and Tony had taught us how to tackle a little bit. But it was Coach Roper that really helped me with my form tackling of how to wrap someone up and not let go. Once you, once you hit them, you, you hit them and you wrap them at the same time and you bring them down. And I remember that drill. And I loved that drill. That one-on-one -on -one drill was great. And I was eating them up, man. And Coach Roper was a Belafonte. That's going to be a, he's going to be a linebacker. He's going to be a linebacker. I love that Belafonte. He just goes in there and he loves the game. You can tell. And then one day, they decided to put us in what they call the bull ring. The bull ring is outlawed now. It's outlawed. A lot of kids got hurt going through the bull ring. And, and maybe you ever heard of that, Mike? You ever heard of the bull ring? I thought maybe you had, because I mean, I remember it being on social media back in the early 2000s. But it was outlawed actually before the 90s, I think, if I'm correct on that. I think before the 90s, it was outlawed. But when I played, I, I was playing, that was 1974 when I was playing. I was about 10 or 11. And we were in the bull ring. And, you know, he made Keith go first. Keith was our quarterback. Keith went first. And Keith went in there. And Keith was a small kid. But Keith just knew how to handle himself in the bull ring. And he was like, Keith came out of the bull ring. He goes, oh, Belafonte, you're going to love it. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to love it, Keith. It didn't look like you were having fun to me. What happens is they put one person in the middle and you got a circle of about 30 guys around and he gives everybody in that ring a number. And when your number's called, you go right at that guy and you hit him. And man, so about six guys went and they all came out. And, you know, Keith was the only one that said it was great. The other five guys, they didn't think it was so great. So then it was my turn and I was scared. I'm not going to, I'm not, I was scared, but I got in there and he called the first number. And I remember who number that was. So when he came at me, I knew where to turn. But by the time he got to the fourth or fifth number, I didn't know where they were coming from. I was just being hit every which way. I was like a target and I couldn't, and I was going through hard times and I was going through a lot of conflict and a lot of trials in that bull ring. But when he said, Belafonte, you're done, good job. I came out of that bull ring going, man, what happened? My, I had a cut on my, on my finger, my lip was busted. I mean, I wore a mouthpiece, but somehow my lip still was busted, and I had some scrapes on my legs, and I, but I survived the bull ring. And after we did the bull ring, the coach had pizza for us because we all survived the bull ring. And then the next week we played our first game. First time I ever played on defense, I was playing the monster. We had a monster back. I was the monster. I went to the strong side of the formation and they ran pitch out right to my side. And when they ran that pitch out to my side, I forced up and I tackled that kid and I hit that kid so hard, I heard him go, oh! And when he went, oh, he fumbled the ball and, and, and uh, uh, Ed Price picked up the ball and ran in and scored. And we beat that team 40 something to nothing. And, and Coach Roper said, Belafonte, you, you brought us victory today. That first hit, that made the whole game. That team was scared of us after that first hit. And I remember, I, I'm, I'm telling you all of this to tell you that we go through trials. And sometimes, you know, when you make it through trials and you see how far you've come, it builds you up. And that's what happens with, that's what he's saying with, count this as pure joy when you go through trials. Because when you get through it, realize what you went through and it will form you and it will make you into something great. By the time I got in the ninth grade, I wasn't scared to tackle anybody. And when I went, to, went out for the team at East High School football, the coaches said, all right, we're gonna see who's the, who's the real man now. And I remember the first time I tackled, I, that was nobody I couldn't tackle. And then he said, Josh, he said, I mean, he said, Craig, you wanna, you wanna run over this guy? Craig Hodges was the leading running back in Nashville at that time. And Craig Hodge said, yeah, I'm going to tear Belafonte up. And man, when Craig came, I, I didn't have no fear. I just went low. I wrapped him up and I drove him back. 
And coach says, wow, this kid is for real. And so I got to start on the kickoff team just because I could tackle as a freshman. And so when we go through these trials, we have to build it up. You have to work on it. You have to work on your craft. You know, when we go through hard times, we have to realize what are we going through it for? Maybe God's preparing for us something to, to do something better. And that's what I learned from football. Football helped me to not be afraid of anybody. If I got in a fight, I would try to tackle you because that was my best weapon. But we go through trials. And sometimes we go through trials because it helps you to be a better Christian. I went through divorce and I, I didn't like it. I wanted to be married to her forever. But I'm telling you, after the divorce, I became a better Christian. I'm learning and I'm adding to my knowledge. And one thing that I've just come to realize is that I need to act like Jesus acts and I need to be reading my Bible every day. And I'm going to say that from now on. Everyone needs to be reading their Bible every day because it will give you the tools that you need to face the hard times of this world that we face. Let's go on. The second verse says, oh, and I love this verse. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. My sin of the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole the whole my whole sinful self has been nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord oh my soul it is well it is well because jesus christ died for us it is well man because Jesus gave us a second chance. Because we can't keep the law. We're going to break the law. And any time we break the law, we hurt God. But God loves us anyway. He loved us anyway. Whew. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed our Redeemer. Thank you, God. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love. His own love. For us. So while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's just amazing. Matthew 26 and 28. We use this for the Lord's Supper a lot, but I, I just want to read this verse. Matthew 26 and 28. Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It's nailed to the cross. We no longer have to worry about it or lay in that miry muck we can come forth and live as Jesus does and live like Jesus does and serve others and love others and care about others because of what Christ has done for us and we get the chance the next part of that says praise the Lord praise the Lord Psalms 156 says let everything that has breath praise the Lord and there are some other verses down there that say praise the Lord. But Psalms 106 says, praise the Lord and give thanks to the Lord for he is good. God is good. People blame God all the time because they don't understand it. They're not really seeking out to see who God is. They're not putting enough time in God's word to understand how God works, how God is, what God wants, how God provides, how God has taken care of us. They don't even know. When people survive those hurricanes in Florida, you know, I hear a couple people say, God spared our lives. And then I hear other people say, yeah, we made it through the hurricane because I made this barricade and it was great. Ain't giving God no credit. Because he don't know. He don't know it was God that saved him. But we need to recognize. We need to recognize. And then verse 3. Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trunk shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Man, is that going to be a glorious day? I want to be here. Come on, Lord, while I'm living. I want to see this for myself. Because I'm telling you, if I see those clouds and I see the Lord descending, I'm going to know it's Jesus. I'm looking for him every day. I am. I'm looking for him every day. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, right? 
about how the Jews at the time when Jesus was born didn't recognize he was the Savior. I'm not going to make their mistake. I'm looking for Jesus right now. He can come right now as far as I'm concerned. It is well with my soul. I can stand here and tell you this morning. It is well with my soul. Because I know what Jesus has done for me and I'm doing everything that I can to focus on living my life for him. And I, and I tell you what, every week I fail. Every week I fail. I make mistakes. But I repent as soon as I think about it. God, please forgive me. I didn't handle that situation right. I was a little mean to him when he said that to me. And then sometimes I say, Jesus, thank you for being there with me because I didn't retaliate today. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding me to be like you, Jesus. And, I, and sometimes, because I give him praise for that when I do do his will, because I'm trying to condition my mind to do the right thing without even having to think about it. Just do it. I want it to be that good. I want to be that great when it comes to following God's word. Because I can imagine that's going to be a glorious sight. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. After the dead in Christ rise, then we who are still living will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's where I want to be. I want to be caught up in the air, in the clouds with, with, with Jesus, the Lord. I would love to see that because it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. We don't have to worry about anything to meet the Lord in the air. I want to meet him in the air. I want to be there when Jesus comes. And if he doesn't come and I'm dead, then I'll just have to do it the other way. But either way, I am trying to condition myself to be in his will so that I can say it is well with my soul. But what I want to ask you is it well with your soul right now? Are you ready for when the Lord comes, when he descends from heaven to come and get those who were faithful to him? Are you ready? The conclusion of all of this is no matter what we must go through, no matter what we go through, no matter who's mean to us, no matter, I mean, no matter what, H.G. lost four daughters. I can't imagine the grief that him and his wife suffered. I can't imagine the scars it might have left on them. I can't imagine it. But that man wrote this song at that time. And don't you know him and his wife had three more children later on? That's what kind of God we serve. That's what kind of God we serve. In fact, it was one of his daughters that let everybody know that he wrote that hymn when he did on that ship coming to, he had told his, he had obviously told the kids what had happened. It is well with, is it well with your soul? That's the question. No matter what we, we no matter what, we must stay faithful to God. And that is being well with my soul. Matthew 6, says it the best, doesn't it? It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. He says, if you do that, everything else will take care of itself. Everything else will take care of itself. It doesn't matter if you go through hard times or good times. What matters is, is are you seeking God and are you staying faithful to him? And are you seeking his righteousness? That's the lesson today. If there's someone who needs to come, please come while we stand and sing.